2020. Recording. And um, as I, <laughs> I, said, I said to someone the other day, I would have appreciated the experience of being at that conference a whole lot more if I'd realized it was about to just suddenly end and change and um, transition to a radically different context. So it's very nice to see all your faces. Um, and I hope you enjoy, um, enjoy the talk. So thanks, Chris, for the invitation. Uh, to present today. He caught me at a weak moment and I said yes, I would like to do this thing. Um, and I realised as I was kind of putting this together that I haven't actually watched this film, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Um, I drew on it in the title um, and I'm sure it is full of ghastly colonial Western <laughs> tropes. So let's move on from that. So the ideas of Good, The Bad and Ugly um, are all right through. So qualitative research, I have to try and keep looking at this camera. Um, apologies if I keep walking out of frames of people. Um, so qualitative research refers to a cluster of approaches that are part of the empirical project of research. Um, the wider project is evidence-based practice um, that aims to develop situated, contextual, nuanced, rich, real-world accounts and information. Um, and qualitative research is far more than quantitative research about telling stories. Big stories, interesting stories, little stories, unwelcome stories, revealing stories, all the stories. And accounts or stories take us on a journey of discovery. They often give us new information, they reveal, they may contain conclusions, and often they serve social or moral functions. And I think a talk like this is also the telling of a story. And so this story today will hopefully give you some new information. It contains some conclusions, but maybe fewer than you might want. Um, there's definitely a dose of morality in here. And I hope you'll stick with me and I hope you'll find something of insight and use to take away, something to agree with, something to disagree with, something to inform practice, to inform scholarship, or at the very least to inform thinking and reflection. And consideration. So stories and storytelling depend on a few things and one of these is the storyteller. The story and the storyteller are connected. The storyteller is an active character in the story even if they're often apparently invisible in the narrative itself. The storyteller selects, reveals and obscures, they emphasize, they interpret and they conclude. And so it would be remiss not to acknowledge myself as the storyteller in this process. And I will do my best to kind of locate my story a little bit, to locate the values and the principles that inform where I speak from, both formally and informally. So I come to things from a counter-normative perspective, both as a person and as a scholar. My background as a scholar is broadly within health, um, and so there will be references to health in this talk. Um, but from the start, I was a feminist scholar looking at topics of gender and bodies and sex and sexuality in ways which sought to challenge prevailing norms and ideas within society, um, which are often restrictive and negatively impact on people's um, potential and well-being. And I've been situated from early on within critical psychology, but before critical psychology was even really a thing with a name. The first books that had critical psychology in their title and named it as such um, were published the year I started my PhD. So my talk today um, concerns qualitative research and particularly thematic analysis. And qualitative research has become increasingly popularized and you know, the amount of people here today is, is a lovely um, endorsement of that. Um, but it's not always valued. Um, and a few years ago, there was a big furore with the British Medical Journal uh, with the hashtag BMJ no qual after McGill's qualitative health research group published a rejection letter from the BMJ which said that qualitative studies are extremely low priority for the BMJ. Our research shows they're not as widely accessed, downloaded or cited as other research. So immediately you've got some metricized reading of value which we could spend a whole other talk. <laughs> Someone should do that talk. Um, and then this led to a big contestation and um, refutation of this claim. And so this is relevant to me as a qualitative health researcher, and I do um, identify as a qualitative researcher. Um, but that's values more than methods-based, and I'll get into this and talk about this a bit more. 
And so I don't think it's the case that simply anything done with textual data is good and anything and everything qualitative should be valued. So qualitative research is not always done well, and sometimes it's done quite poorly. And it's often done by people who don't have the benefit of training or experience, sometimes reflecting another myth of qualitative, that it's easy, spoiler alert for anyone, not. Um, and also um, that anyone can do it. Um, that it's not a skill like, for instance, multivariate analyses or structural equation modeling. Don't ask me to explain those, um, I can't. And I would never expect to be able to do them without good training. But somehow we often expect people to be able to do qualitative research without good training, or we expect to be able to do it ourselves without good training. So hopefully I'm gonna sort of disabuse that notion at the same time as also ho hopefully providing a kind of welcome in to the space that qualitative research does provide. So I am gonna be somewhat harsh. Um, hopefully not terrifyingly harsh, just a little bit encouragingly harsh um, on some of the qualitative research I see and call out some problems, um, and specifically uh, within thematic analysis. But in doing so, I want this to be understood as in the spirit of better um, and maybe even best practice to understand ourselves as situated, impactful producers on the, of the knowledge that we produce. So to kind of think of ourselves as as we engage with that production of knowledge. So there's no neutral objective researcher for me, as will be fairly clear uh, if it's not already. Um, and so crucially in the in this sort of setting up and, and doing that, I have to acknowledge that I come from a very privileged position of deep and long training in qualitative research um, through a master's and a PhD, which was taught and supervised by some of the leading methodologists in my broad area, including my master, supervised, supervised by Nicola Gavey, um, who's here in psychology. Um, and she initially nurtured any of, and all of the critical questioning tendencies um, that I might have had and gave them a place to flourish. And I need to uh, acknowledge also my co-author by all things thematic analysis, Victoria Clark. Um, we met at the start of our PhDs. We started at the same time at Loughborough University, right there in the Midlands, in the middle of England. Um, our thinking around qualitative research was, was fermented um, in what was a heady and challenging environment at Loughborough. Their social sciences department was a virtually entirely critical department and environment. And our thinking was then further shaped and honed and developed through our research experiences, our teaching experiences, our supervision experiences, and our writing, and our thinking and our development work around thematic analysis and other qualitative research. Um, that's our writing, that's an example of our writing. So some books and papers, chapters, and other things. And I've got a list of um, some, some recent things that may be useful at the end. Um, so, Although a crude opposition between qualitative or quantitative is often still articulated, such divisions oversimplify and hide the diversity of things that qualitative research can and does do, and likewise quantitative research. Um, and we could have indeed a whole other lecture and talk on um, what do we mean, what do we think about um, data and what counts and how do we um, deconstruct some of these binaries so what do I mean here, given that I am talking about qualitative? Most basically, I'm talking about the analysis of text-based data, sometimes also visual data, to identify, explore, interrogate, and report at the level of meaning. So as you will know, because I've said this a few times already, um, qualitative research is not a single thing. Um, as both theory and practice, it can be informed by vastly different values. Sometimes it's a realist project to uncover and reveal what really happens. Sometimes it can, it's a constructionist project that interrogates and critiques practice or representation. Sometimes it seeks to go deep inside the person's life and their experiences. Sometimes it's concerned with the out there world. Sometimes it's one of many other different things as well. Sometimes it's some of those or more than one of those. So one size does not fit all. And there are perhaps 
and probably better divisions in how we think about research and scholarship and the production of knowledge. But as I said, that's a different talk. So I'm going to focus on CMAS analysis in this talk. Um, and with CMAS analysis, um, like with qualitative, there's diversity, diversity there's variable quality, um, and there's practices that constitute better and poorer ways of doing things. So um, think of today's take home message as key things not to do and key things to do when thinking about and doing um, thematic analysis. So in 2005, this is quite entertaining to read this actually, <laughs> what 2005 was like. Um, some of you were very young then, I was not. <laughs> I was five years post my PhD and I was on my first sabbatical base at the University of West of England in Bristol. I had gone from my PhD straight into um, a lectureship here in psychology. I had another job. Um, and by the time I got to my sabbatical, I was burnt out and exhausted. And for anyone who feels like they underperform on their sabbaticals, the only thing I achieved on my sabbatical was um, writing a paper with Victoria Clark that we've been talking about for years since our PhD days and finally decided now was the time to write. And that paper was on thematic analysis. Some of you have all heard of it. <laughs> um, we wrote it speaking to our local context um, as psychology academics and specifically for our community of mostly critical qualitative psychology colleagues and students. And that shaped how we wrote it, what we said, and indeed, some of the unarticulated assumptions and values that informed it. We'd write a different paper now, and we have indeed written different papers since, and books and things like that. Um, and we've been reflecting a lot over the last few years on this and discussing some of the challenges and problems um, that we see. So this original paper proved unanticipatedly popular. We wanted to write something useful, uh, but didn't um, anticipate a hot paper that was so used. So quite recently, it just went over 100,000 citations on Google Scholar, which is the equivalent of a viral um, yeah. <laughs> paper, which still freaks us out. Still freak out by this. But despite the popular academic saying that any citation is a good citation, not all of those citations are good citations. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is briefly demarcate the field of thematic analysis as we see it now, um, and then move on to problems and solutions. And I do really want to emphasize this is our take on things. So other people will have a different take on the field. And other people do have a do take, different take on the field. And some people uh, contest our take. So I'm not saying this is the whole truth um, and the only truth as it were. Um, so, what is thematic analysis? So we, we still sort of stand by the original description of thematic analysis as a method for identifying, analyzing, reporting patterns, themes within data, minimally organizing and describing um, in rich detail, but frequently going further than that and in interpreting various aspects of the research topic. But within that, there's lots to unpack and quite different ways some of these things get interpreted and operationalized. So thematic analysis, we now think, is better understood as an umbrella term for a, um, um, as an umbrella term for a family of practices. And it refers to quite different practices, some of which share similarity in looking for patterned meaning, um, with codes or coding and themes as key components. And we currently think emphasizing the currently because this may change again as well, um, that there are three broad clusters of approaches to TA within this broad umbrella, each informed by somewhat different values and practices and sitting differently on embracing qualitative research values. So qualitative research values, what do I mean by this? Something sparkly and gold. <laughs> Um, what I really mean is a valuing of the subjective, the situated, the contextual, the idea that we cannot find the dislocated ultimate truth that applies universally when we're exploring social or health, et cetera, issues. 
but that there is much to be gained by understanding within context and in understanding the nuance and texture of the rich diversity of human lives, experiences, and things like health and illness experiences within that. The values of broadly positive empiricism and the search for truth, the need for objectivity and controlling bias, replicability as value, these are not part of the set of qualitative research values. But it's not the same as saying that positive is qualitative research and analysis. These cannot be done. They are. They do get done for the time. There's lots out there. Um, but rather, they don't fit within this, this broad framework of qualitative research values. So keep in mind, as I kind of talk through some of the different approaches and different ideas, and, and um, speak of the diversity across TA and qualitative researching, that I also speak from that position of someone speaking from and within qualitative research values. So we now conceptualize um, three different clusters of approaches to TA. And within each of these clusters, there's different versions and different orientations and so on. And these can vary quite dramatically from each other when you start to sort of drill down. Um, they vary across paradigmatic orientation, how they conceptualize the theme, which is key focus and so crucial to understand their analytic process, and the role or practice of the researcher within them. I'll briefly go through these before talking about problems and challenges. So if we think about paradigms and paradigmatic orientations, um, or really this is about what we're doing and how we approach um, TA, and to, to the extent to which what we understand what we're doing is something which embraces qualitative research values as key. And US-based critical psychologists, Michelle Fine and Susan Gordon, made a distinction that I find really useful. They talk about qualitative researchers um, or qualitative studies as either being big Q or small Q, where big Q refers to a kind of a process which is embedded in qualitative research values, where a small Q is the use of qualitative data more within the sort of frames of um, traditional positivist and process research values, and that will come through the talk. So big Q says qualitative about contextualized subjective meaning making processes, uh, interpretation and analysis reflects our situatedness, our skills, and the raw materials that we're working with. So we're more kind of like these sculptors, um, we're producers, we are in our out in some way. Um, and small Q tends to be more information seeking. The truth is in or under there, and we're waiting to find it. Um, the best ways to do this are these rigorous, thorough, biased, um, and non-influential in relation to our data and the interpretation of them. So more like archaeology and uncovering um, what we're looking at. But um, archaeologists will tell you that this is a terrible analogy and we shouldn't use it because archaeology is way more complex than that. But maybe the stereotype of archaeology. <laughs> um, so, what about a theme? Now, this might seem like a singular thing that everyone would disagree agree on, but no, actually, everyone disagrees or there are different versions. Um, and these versions and the different ways that they're conceptualized are actually fundamentally critical to questions of quality and process and what it is that we're doing and what we're claiming to find um, when we do our analyses. So for some, themes reflect the clustering together of information related to a topic or a domain of meaning or interest. What unites the data within a theme is not meaning, but rather the focus of the topic or the data. So to use an example from a current project of mine on healthy eating, when I say current project, I mean a project that's been going on for a long time and I haven't analyzed any of the data of yet, so this is my hypothetical um, topic uh, summary theme. These topic summary themes might include something like costs of healthy eating or definitions of healthy eating. 
Within each of these, there might be quite variable and sometimes even contradictory meanings expressed, like healthy eating is seen as uh, expensive or uh, healthy eating is affordable if you just prioritize it, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, and there's been some good discussion about whether these sort of themes, topic summaries represent a meaningful and useful conceptualization of a theme or whether they are underdeveloped and not fully realized themes, effectively analysis forestalled. Um, and the type of theme that critics of these sorts of themes advocate for is what you might call a fully realized theme that captures a pattern of meaning in the data united by a shared idea. And we're critical of this idea. Um, so we situate ourselves within that kind of group of people. So our idea of a theme and many others is a pattern of shared meaning or ideas or concepts. And I like the idea of the analogy or metaphor of a galaxy um, or a solar system, a cluster of related ideas, meanings, articulations, expressions, assumptions, statements, and so on, that all revolve around something that holds them together. This thing here at the core. A core idea they all fundamentally share. And this core idea might be something that's very semantically expressed, very clearly articulated, or it might be something latent, an assumption, a conceptualization, a framing of an idea or a concept, something beneath the surface, not immediately transparently obvious. So within this idea of themes, themes are built of smaller meaning units. Um, codes that unite data that might otherwise appear on the surface to be quite disparate or where meaning occurs in quite varied and unexpected contexts. So related to a topic like healthy eating, a theme within this conceptualization may be something like it's basically killing you, which would capture uh, an articulation and a construction of anything other than healthy food, um, whatever the definition of that might be, and that would probably be and is quite variable, but is effectively life removing rather than life sustaining. And you get, I've made that up as a theme, but it is a, an, an idea evident within healthy eating, my healthy eating data sets. Um, so, different ideas of themes and different kind of ideas of analytic process as well. Um, and how things like coding um, and theme identification or theme development and language matters um, are tackled. So do you take coding as a process for identification of information relevant to an area of meaning or an object of analysis? Do you conceptualize and identify themes early on in an analytic process? So coding is used primarily as a way of identifying those. Um, and tools or techniques to help this include code books and measures to check accuracy or reliability and so on. Or, do you treat coding and theme development as organic developing processes, evolving through the um, engagement of the researcher with their data? So codes, themes ultimately are not predeterminable in advance of ongoing analysis. So the analysis is more like an adventure um, where you don't know the destination or indeed the journey that you're going to take to get to that destination. And then there's also um, different approaches um, conceptualize themes uh, in quite different ways. So some almost conceptualize themes as analytic inputs. They're developed early in the analytic process, um, following some data familiarization or first steps in the analytic process, and they guide subsequent data coding. And sometimes they're conceptualized as outputs, at the language of outputs, but I'm going to just remove it. Um, they develop later in the analytic process. They represent the outcome of coding and theme development processes. Um, and they're not something which are predetermined or early determined or early identifiable. And there's a bit of an overlay between themes as um, topic summaries and input kind of conceptualizations <coughs> of themes and themes as galaxies um, and output type conceptualizations and approaches to do it. And these things matter because they guide what you do and how you do it and how you do it well. So understanding these differences matters. 
And these also connect to um, how you conceptualize um, what it is that you're doing when you identify um, a theme. Is a theme something which you somehow implicitly conceptualize or imagine as kind of waiting to be identified, waiting to be discovered? It's kind of like buried treasure, which when you find it's like, yay, um, hopefully it's good and worth waiting for. Um, or do you conceptualize them um, as actively produced by the researcher? This isn't about making up themes and that sort of thing, so much as seeing theme generation as something that occurs at the intersection of the data, the researcher's interpretive frameworks, prior training, skills, assumptions, um, identities, locations, and so on. So within this idea, you wouldn't imagine that different researchers would necessarily produce the same analysis from the same data set because they're different people coming at the data set in different ways. Whereas within this conceptualization, implicitly there are things to be found and you can be better or poorer at identifying those. And so that brings me to the, the final and main also conceptualization of um, that, that sort of varies across these different approaches to, to TA, which is the conceptualization of the TA researcher. So across different forms of TA, Researchers are conceptualized as engaged in a process. This is kind of a universal thing that we as researchers are engaged in a process of managing our subjectivity. But how researcher subjectivity is managed and how it should be managed varies quite drastically. So it ranges from embracing, recognizing, and reflecting on the sub on your subjectivity as a researcher, um, finding ways to robustly incorporate that into your practice for quality outcome, to developing systems to control for researcher subjectivity or bias, and so using multiple coders to get more accurate coding or code books to guide the process are often framed in terms of those sorts of terms. And so uh, this is an example of this that came in response to a paper that we've written. Uh, the authors should discuss how they attempted to avoid bias in the analytic process. So it's a kind of very common, uh, commonly kind of articulated concern. And it's absolutely appropriate to some forms of thematic analysis, but not others. And needless to say, we didn't discuss how we attempted to avoid bias. We um, put it in fit with the approach to CA that we were using. So, what I'm going to propose is that to do good thematic analysis, we need to embrace an explicitly values-led approach to doing TA, regardless of what those values are, whether they're more positivist empiricist values, uh, whether they're critical, qualitative values, whatever they are, that values are acknowledged at the start, and we think as, as thematic analysis researchers, of what those values then mean in terms of practices and the choices we enact in our research process. So this means understanding um, that whatever we're doing, whether we're being objective, neutral, unbiased researchers, whether being, we're being situated, uh, subjective researchers, no matter what it is, all of those things are shaped and led by values. And recognizing those, being aware of the ways that shape and constrain what we do is crucially important for quality. And these values are sometimes easy to identify and sometimes hard to identify. They're both disciplinary and location based and shaped. And so to do good thematic analysis, no matter what, I would say we need to be reflexive. We need to be reflexively interrogating ourselves and our process as scholars and researchers. So a takeaway from all that is that there is no such thing as thematic analysis without some kind of caveat or some kind of um, version attached to it. And so we currently, as I said, think about 
three different clusters of different types of approaches which share similarities. And we think the family idea is quite good because you know you're all related, but some of you get on well and some of you fight. <laughs> you know, some of you hate each other and some of you love each other. And those things can shift and change as well. Um, so these have some similarities and some differences. And I'll briefly kind of um, talk about what we what we kind of the, the approaches that we're broadly kind of describing with them, and then mostly I'm going to talk about reflective yeah. So um, what we're calling coding reliability TA, and we chose these names to try and capture what we see as core differentiating aspects of these different clusters, are a group of approaches that fit within small Q or positivist empiricist orientations to qualitative research. And we're ensuring a reliable and unbiased process for coding and theme development is central. And this is done um, by developing a code book that is applied to the data by more or one researcher. It's a kind of idealized and simplified model. Um, the reliability of coding is measured, it's fixed if it's problematic, um, and it's reported. Um, so you get um, reports on the measures of coding reliability and research reports that report on these analyses. And determination of codes is effectively by consensus. So people agreeing on how to code what and what to code is seen as best practice. Um, and disagreement is problematic because it undermines the kind of question of reliability and, and your um, interrated reliability score. Um, and within this, coding is seen as a process primarily for the identification of themes. So as I talked about earlier, themes themselves are often determined or decided before coding, and coding is the process to identify the evidence for the prevalence of the existence of those sorts of themes within the data set. And, and themes are often clustered around topics rather than patterns of, of shared meaning. So that's kind of a gloss for coding reliability approaches. And then we have a group that we, that we uh, would call codebook um, TA, and these approaches are often about themes, but they're often not called thematic analysis, but they're kind of within the same family of approaches. So they include approaches like template, and template analysis and framework analysis and matrix analysis. And these approaches are underpinned by qualitative research values, um, but they retain the sort of small Q or coding reliability concern for structure in the analytic process. So they center on the development of some type of code book, a matrix, um, a framework, a template, and so on, that is used to then shape and guide the coding process um, and the, the process of theme development and theme review. Um, so there's a, um, often a pragmatic consideration that leads to the kind of application of these different things. So often this work comes from applied areas, often health research, policy research, looking to work with teams of people, sometimes inexperienced researchers, and generate relatively efficiently um, actionable outcomes and useful findings. So that's why there is a, a kind of combination of the sort of the values and the openness and the more kind of structured and directed approach. Where these, these approaches differ is that code book approaches um, don't tend to use coding reliability as a measure of good practice and often explicitly reject it as a type of approach and often um, do not follow a kind of consensus model for the coding of, of data. So finally, reflexive thematic analysis is what um, we're now using for our and other people's approaches, which are quite similar, which um, have more organic and open methods, which center and value researcher subjectivity, um, and a fully qualitative values, both in kind of conceptualization ideas, but also in practice as well. So the process of research is open and organic, themes are an outcome of a process of development and review, 
which is grounded in a thorough and robust coding process. And the themes are conceptualized as galaxies, as clusters of shared meaning organized around a core idea or a core concept in the researcher's subjectivity is seen as part of that. So three overlapping related approaches, but um, quite clashing in some fundamental ways in terms of what you should do, what good practice looks like, what, what even acceptable practice looks like. So on that note, <laughs> oh, sorry, the bad, the ugly. Um, Oops, oh, oh no. Sorry. I can go back up. Oh, no. Lost our feed to the Zoom folks. All right. Let's pull that up real quick. Sorry for those of you staring at the back of my head. The screen is working, which is why I'm trying to, mm. not very good spatially, trying to translate across directions. Okay. So, um, having said all that, that's a very long setup to now get to the problems. Um, so, clearly, we haven't read all the papers that have cited our work. We would not have time to do that, but we have read some of them. Um, and through some of that reading and through people sending us things and saying, look at this, um, we have started... Um, to see patterns of things that we see as problematic and how people claim and describe what they do in relation to thematic analysis and thematic analysis specifically. And we see this both as a conceptual thing, but also as a quality thing. And quality matters because we want to be doing good, good research. We want to have good processes. We want to have conceptually coherent work. Um, we don't want to set ourselves up for dismissal by the BMJ, for instance. Terrible, terrible, mm -hmm. limited, useful, qualitative stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and working on this, and we've written a paper which is about quality. So this will draw on the key things we talk about in that paper. So that's listed at the end um, in case you feel like you need to remember what these are. Um, so in thinking about the process of identifying these sort of patterns and the problems, um, we also thought about you know, that question of quality more widely and more generally. And so I'm gonna um, outline some of these problems and these connect to things I've already said. So I've already set you up to um, understand why these are problematic. Hopefully you agree with me, but don't have to because it's right here, TA. Um, and then I'm gonna finish up with a discussion of how we can collectively and individually work with quality TA. And although this is critique, so this is kind of like, it's a really tricky thing to do because you might be sitting there and you might go, oh no, I've done that. I just <laughs> said that terrible thing and I did that last week. So the purpose of this is not to name and shame. The purpose is not to blame people if they have done these things unwittingly. As I said at the start, a lot of training and time to think and write about qualitative research, not everybody has. Um, and so instead of kind of thinking about this as naming and shaming, we're hoping that can, it can be framed as a, um, a, a way to encourage reflection on what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it and how we write about it. How we write about it's really important. We're going to come back to that at the end. And also, um, to recognize that we're not always operating in circumstances that are of our own making or are, are ideal. And so, you know, there are numerous times when I've navigated a review process for publication and have ended up doing things which go against, you know, something I would say, this is what we should really do, but in the circumstances, you know, means must, as it were. So there's often moments of compromise, but hopefully a takeaway is that those should be null and compromises rather than unwitting compromises. So, um, I'll try and keep doing that right. We've had a preview of this. The first um, mistake or error or bad and ugly is assuming that TA is just one thing and simply writing about it as if it's one approach. And we get that there's much more in the space of 
we're much more in the space of thinking and writing about TA than most people are. Um, and when we wrote about it first, we didn't make any differentiation. Um, but lots of our writing and thinking about this since has done this. Um, but what I think you still see inadvertently is saying, I use this method, thematic analysis, but no clarification on which particular um, approach or how it aligned with the assumptions of one type of approach or the other. Um, so we encourage um, TA researchers to clearly demarcate which approach to TA they're using. Um, and to be clear in how they frame and describe TA, that it's not just a singular or generic thing, and that they locate the particular approach they're using and cite relevant literature that fits with that approach rather than um, a range. But also, if you are drawing on different approaches, explain that, be clear about why that is and how you're doing it and how it works or what it is that you're doing it. So it's being, I guess, knowing is a key kind of message, being knowing what you do and how you do it. I think that's really important that I'm not sort of suggesting these are things that are set in stone and can never change and there's no variation possibly from the qualitative values at all, um, but rather um, being aware. Second, um, <laughs> none of you would ever do that. <laughs> um, and I wish this for you were a joke, but it is the most generous interpretation we can make of some of the things that we see. Um, things that we supposedly <laughs> advocate for, things that we say to do, like integrated reliability and code books and all these things, the most generous interpretation is that people have not actually read what we've done but they've dropped it in as a citation because someone's told them that they have to sign it. And we know that happens because people tell us that anecdotally, people who are in review processes or editorial boards or whatever. So this is, um, we understand that the pressure of academia is intense and there's this publish and perish and or perish. Publish and perish, that's the worst outcome. Publish and <laughs> say don't perish. Um, imperatives and all those very, very problematic things that are going on. Um, the saying of read without reading is a terrible idea. Um, so the solution here is actually to recognize that in doing qualitative research, understanding methodology and understanding what we're doing is part of the scholarship. So doing your homework, knowing what it is that you're talking about is um, what's most important. Um, a third problem um, is what we've sort of called unjustified mashups. So <laughs> that's not where people, people are writing about going, well, I, you know, I really like this element of this approach and I'm using that element of that approach because they work together to allow me to do X or Y, but rather where they're going, I'm using thematic analysis and I'm citing coding reliability scholars and frameworks and reflexive TA approaches and there's no kind of acknowledgement that what they say they did and how they did it and why they did it is vastly different across those different approaches. So there's no knowingness in what's been done. Um, and I think this also kind of often reflects an idea that these approaches are just simply technical concerns, that they're just a method that you can just apply to your data and you get answers rather than being embedded within a kind of framework or series of frameworks that are necessary to validate and legitimize what it is that you're doing. So if you are doing anything matchup related, explain, justify, talk about why you've done that. So I've already hinted at this one. So when we first wrote about TA, some people have misinterpreted this as saying that it's um, an atheoretical approach, that it is just that tool and technique that you just apply to the data. But really what we were trying to say, more clearly or more explicitly, was that it's more or less, we keep going less and less, um, theoretically flexible. That reflexive TA can be used within different broad theoretical paradigms, 
from more realist and essentialist approaches to more critical constructionist, relativist type of one across a range of ontologies and epistemologies. So we're talking theory at that level, not at the level of kind of more specific explanatory theories. There's no inbuilt rounding or mandatory theory within um, reflexive TA, except it's values based within critically qualitative approaches. And that's why we have shifted from going as theoretically flexible to going as sort of somewhat flexible rather than um, a more open framework. That doesn't mean that analysis, so it doesn't mean that analysis and interpretation should be able to happen outside of theory. Like theory is necessary for everything. Theory gives us the foundations for what it is that we do. Any form of TA um, requires its own and has its own theoretical um, foundation. And so the theoretical flexibility of different approaches to TA are already demarcated and delimited by the broad value set and paradigmatic kind of locatedness of those approaches. Um, so then there are sort of some depictions that we see or some claims which connect to some of these ideas. And these aren't um, necessarily bad things, but they're assumptions which <clears throat> tell a particular story, which we would say is problematic because it, it suggests a sort of limited understanding of what's at stake or what, what's going on. So one of these is framing TA as a method that's only capable of reporting truth or capturing experience, that it provides a realist or essentialist or experiential method for finding things out. So all forms of TA can be that and can do that um, and can do it very well. Um, but certainly with reflective TA, it's far from often or only experiential and realist. realist. Um, and right from the start, no doubt, reflecting our training in critical psychology um, and our own kind of inclinations towards those interpretative approaches, we've used TA in a more critical, non-realist, non-experiential method and approach. So the assumption that TA is just one thing or offers one way of doing things is problematic. One hand, it reflects sloppy scholarship, just not true. Um, but secondly, it also reiterates and reinforces a myth, a myth about TA that's kind of out there and has legs, as it were, it's a terrible expression, I don't know why popped into my head. Um, it has a life that um, keeps being rearticulated. And so not giving life to that is a different by claiming that. And it simply, as I said, doesn't have strong foundations. It's not true. So key is avoiding really assumptions and locating the values and the theories that inform the type of TA that you're doing rather than treating it in this particular way. Very closely connected, another assumption um, is that TA is only a descriptive or data reduction method in which data patterns are paraphrased or summarized. And we see this quite often um, when it's at Kind of described as a method that only offers a low level of interpretative possibility um, and that other approaches are needed to be overlaid on top of whatever you do with thematic analysis to provide you with interpretative depth and most commonly we, what we see is that this is either grounded theory or narrative analysis but it's really an impoverished um, conceptualization because it sort of it situates ta just as sort of pragmatic data management process and then interpretation as something which happens somewhere, some other time, some other way, some other how, through ground theory or narrative analysis and so on. And we see it's problematic for two reasons. Um, and the first of these is that description and interpretation are positioned as separate and distinct activities. Um, and that reflects to some extent the kind of traditional idea of a result from the discussion section, rather than seeing those two things as uh, meshed together. And but secondly, also in the sort of idea of a descriptive or summative analysis, the re researcher appears to be a passive, disinterested, decontextualized conduit for the voices of participants. So they are sort of absented conceptually. And also, maybe ethically, they're, they're 
the role in, in the production of their research kind of disappears from view. And so we would say that even the more descriptive types of TA that people do, they are always interpreted activities undertaken by researchers um, who are situated and who read their data through the lenses of their particular social, cultural, historical, disciplinary, political, and ideological positionings. We can't take that out of it. We're always somewhere there in our analysis. We're always in our story. So, and so this also just simply obscures the potential of thematic analysis for offering deeply interpretive, theorized um, analyses. And it, it reflects a number of things because it also reflects a kind of poor level of scholarship or not reading and not really understanding what's possible and what's doable. Um, the final um, few kind of challenges or problems that we see is one of the confusing codes and themes. So there's no absolute or total conceptualization of codes or themes across TA and codes and coding work in different ways, have different relationships to themes across different um, styles of TA. Reflexive TA, we see codes and the coding process as the building blocks for developing the analysis. And we originally used the kind of metaphor of bricks, codes, bricks, and this is a stone house and a brick house that you often understand. Um, and that the different bricks build a wall and that wall is your theme and those are your codes and so on. So that's sort of a bit too linear and a bit too problematic. I think an idea of a kind of multifaceted prism is a better way for thinking about it. The codes reflect different cut aspects of a crystal and the theme itself is multifaceted. It has many, many different elements. But the, the codes that will, tap, that will bring you to this are not known beforehand, are not predetermined, and you don't know what this is ahead of time. So we often see things being reported that are just single facets, single ideas, single units, rather than this kind of rich multifaceted thing. And then there is this um, mixing up or using of um, different conceptualizations of things within approaches to TA, which have quite different understandings. So the use of um, a topic summary approach to themes where you're using reflexive TA, and we've very clearly said that doesn't um, represent a theme. So again, many of these challenges or problems are interconnected. Um, coming to the last couple, <laughs> possibly the most important two, um, not really. Um, um, far too often, we read a description where somebody says that Floyd, Brown, and Clark, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they report um, that their themes emerged with some variation. Now, this phrase has come to haunt us or be latched onto us, um, although we were kind of delighted that someone suggested this. There's this. Etsy site, which some of you may know, but it's Science on a Postcard, and it's a truly wonderful little space to go and support a small craft person who does things. And she makes she's based in Scotland, ships internationally. I'm really not advertising for any kind of commission, but I just I love um, her products anyway. So she has done these things, do not emerge um, pages. And if I'd really been organized, I could have worn my one to talk about it. No. Um, but it has become kind of latched onto us, and it's, it's not even our idea, but we articulate it in a way which obviously resonated. Um, many qualitative researchers would make these same kinds of ideas um, and arguments. And I would also note that there are some qualitative methodologies like um, IPA, which do talk about things like emergent themes. So this is not like a universal rule for the entirety of qualitative research. It comes back to knowing what you're doing and why and how you explain it and so on. Um, why do we see the idea that things emerge as a problem? And that's because we theorize reflexive TA as an active, engaged, situated practice um, by a researcher or researchers engaging with the data, the literature, context, in order to develop a rich and sometimes, hopefully often, surprising understanding of the variation of patterning and meaning within their data set. And to work to develop a thematic analysis that captures what they use their skills to ascertain is important to say, not to just reveal what's there. 
What is important to say isn't necessarily clear. It's not necessarily just waiting to reveal itself. Things are not hippos lurking under the muddy surface of the pond to appear before the lucky researcher waiting by the shore. <laughs> so understanding that is fundamental to understanding what reflexive TA was about. So the final uh, bad thing to do is just uncritically accept what we say. Mm -hmm. That includes what I'm saying. Um, this is kind of both slightly, but also sort of deeply serious, because we often read things which say, I followed Brown and Clark's six phases to do my analysis. And this kind of idea that we just follow rules and we just sort of do things that people tell us to do, reflects a process within that's really criticised within qualitative research called kind of proceduralism, that we follow procedures rather than treating method and methodological practice as an active, situated, engaged process of knowledge production, a storytelling process that we're part of. And so to do good reflexive TA requires a thoughtful, considered, active engagement. And it's the lack of that, or the lack of evidence of that in write-ups um, that is problematic, that's troubled to us. So be a thoughtful researcher. Don't slavishly follow what people like I say in talks. Think about it as the title of one of our earlier papers, say, hey, is like we've provided you with a compass and a map to navigate an adventure rather than a packaged holiday deal that you just go off and enjoy. That was back in the day. That worked, right? <laughs> anyway, so reflect critically. Like, I am aware of the time, and I am now at the end of the slides. So how best then to not do these things. How, how can we do good TA if we're going to use it? And to be clear, we should not all use TA all the time. There's a whole cluster of approaches that give us access to different things and we should enjoy and experiment and play around with what it is that we want to know and how best to kind of come to them. But if we are using reflexive TA or TA, how should we do it well? The first is about us as researchers recognizing that we're making choices. We're always making choices whether they're deliberate or not. In thinking about those choices and what particular values or ideas or ideals are underpinning those choices and are they important and be what's important and what's not important, what's crucial and what's a maybe or an if and go either way. And but most importantly, being clear about those choices, that they were choices that we made these decisions and we did these sorts of things. The second is about actions. So how we conduct the research that we do, working on processes and practices in ways that have integrity, um, that are thorough and robust, that are conceptually and methodologically coherent. Or if they aren't, for whatever reason, that we justify and explain why they're not and why that's okay, why that's good even. But this isn't about following rules. It's about understanding what you're doing and how you do it and what does or doesn't work with the approach you're taking and thinking about that and adapting and evolving and changing if you need to or as you need to as you go along. And the third of these is about description. So this is about how we write about what we did and how we write about the outcomes of our analysis. So ensuring that our method or methodology sections are not generic land descriptions that read like um, could be used for 7,000 other studies, but rather that we talk about what it is that we did and the choices we made and how things actually looked and the doing of what it is that we did and so on. Um, not suggesting you put it all in there because methodology sections are always post hoc productions that leave things out and tell a story in a, in a, bird, in a way but rather you shape it to the specifics of what it is that you've done and how you've done it. Um, and so will that guarantee that whatever you do then flies through some peer review process and gets published? Unfortunately, this is mm -hmm. not. Um, but if you have explained what you do and you have got a good foundation for it, you're less likely to be told to describe how you control the bias in your research process or those sorts of things. It might still happen, but you'll have tools and techniques and understandings at your disposal to resist and to counter and to challenge those sorts of things. 
And when you do have to make compromise, as we will do, you will understand what those compromises mean and why and how you can best navigate that within the context of the publication that you're doing. So that's the ideal. Doesn't always happen. Um, but if we do um, want to do TA that reflects the good rather than the bad and the ugly, then coming back to this foundational point about what are the values that are underpinning what we're doing and why is invaluable. So they give us the scope to operate and they legitimize, delegitimize certain things. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, just a reminder, we do have some food after this, but I think we'll take some time for a few questions. And if you're listening at home and want to send some questions in the chat, I can pass that on as well. This is some resources. Here so you can see the message. Okay. Any, any uh, questions or comments? Yes. So I was just thinking back about the, the DMZ comment you got. And um, so, like, one of the things that our college has done fairly well in the last few years to, to maintain some credibility has been like um, all those old science practices and things like registration. And there, there's some discussions recently about you know, registering quantitative research as well. And so I was wondering what you think about that for pending analysis and you know can you see that as something that could help with uh, you know credibility or things like that um, and um, and possibly if you thought about doing it in your work or with your own students. Um, it's a complicated answer. It's a good question. Um, so the question of pre-registration is qualitative. I think it can work for projects which are more sort of positivist oriented, more experience oriented, or projects that have a sense of what it is that the purpose of the research is about and why and a whole lot of things. I think it's more complex, way more complex. Um, and, you know, I'm saying this from not having, um, have I, I will say I have dabbled at the edges of these debates rather than dive right into them. But I think it's when you start to think of your analysis as an open and organic process and that actually the most excellent analysis might be one that you had no idea that it would go there and that you analyze your data in ways that were quite different from how you anticipated early on. And that within a broad qualitative values framework, there's nothing which invalidates that. So that makes it, for me, it makes the question of what, what, is, what advantage might you possibly have with pre-registration in a context like that? Like it doesn't feel like it's adding anything to the legitimacy or the validity of the project itself. Um, but I know there are some there are some qualitative researchers who do advocate for the use of it. Um, and others who completely um, reject it out of hand. And I think one of, one of the tensions in that is the extent to which the doing so requires situating qualitative within a certain set of um, values and research values. But as I say, I have only um, dabbled at the edges of those debates. I got invited to contribute to a thought piece on it and didn't have time. So. Um, it is something which will be interesting to see how it evolves. And I, I can completely see the logic within the more kind of quantitative um, literatures and sort of more sort of um, designs that have kind of hypotheses or, you know, possibly anticipated outcomes and so on, where there is um, more value in that. Um, but I don't know, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting thing that's shaping the, the future. Thank you. Um, seeing as, as you said, TA relies on a foundation of value that you bring towards it, and also speaking as someone who's qualitative yeah. research makes me question my values a lot. Um, what's some yeah. of the values you try to bring along to your research when you're using TA? Um, that is your point about qualitative research challenging your own values is, is also a possible thing that can happen for people and you know can be um, an unexpected part of the process. Um, I think the most fundamental thing. Um, 
like I, I guess that's there's lots and um, but I think the most fundamental thing I would say I try and hold is something which is a combination of awareness of positionality and a reflexive questioning of my interpretative process. So thinking about I'm reading this always as a situated person and what does that mean I'm seeing? What does that mean I'm not seeing? And how does that um, impact the analysis? Not validated or invalidated, but what sort of ways does it shape it? And then being open to kind of questioning those sort of interpretive processes. And within reflexive TA, that's where working with other researchers can be really valuable, I find, for having conversations about interpretative difference that can sort of shape your reflexivity to go, okay, so I, you know, completely miss that aspect of the data set and, you know, what does that mean and what does that tell us about, you know, the topic. A, a good example came from a research group with my um, grad students where I presented some stuff that we, some examples that we used in our um, thematic analysis book. We were kind of working through the data and one of the students said, so you probably obviously noted this, and there's only one instance here, but I'm sure it was all through the data set. And I was like, wow, haven't even spotted that or thought about that at all. And it was a really good example of where, you know, your, your positionings and your, you know, subjective um, stance shapes things. And it's being aware of those as much as we ever can, but also being open to questioning and shifting and changing those, if, if relevant. Or seeing that they bring huge amounts of value. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. Thank you. There's a thing. Oh, yeah, you go. Can I ask about, you mentioned that, um, you know, don't stick to the procedure, but then you are giving us the procedure. And I thought that was the part why qualitative research started being more accepted because there is a procedure, there is a system. So it's um, more, uh, you know, useful as the end of the So you're telling us not to follow it, but then you're giving it to us. You're sending us concrete messages. Well, do I follow it, but I put boundaries all the time? And then how far do I push it before I break your methodology? I think, so this is what you're saying there is a, a key critique, and it reflects a long tension in the debate within qualitative research is where we see it as a craft skill. Now, I think the craft skill idea that you can only learn through doing and, you know, supervision and stuff is great. You know, if you've got those opportunities, that's great, but that's also a huge amount of privilege to be able to be someone who's in that position and can, who can do that. Or can we describe processes for the doing of the research that mean that those who don't have the privilege of learning at the feet of masters, and I say masters quite deliberately, um, can give us kind of tools. And, you know, and there's people who have said very disparaging things about the fact that we've written about a methodology that sets out sort of phases of a process. Where I think, uh, what I would say in relation to your question is that the phases are tools to get you through a process. The phases themselves are are not what's important. They are important because they're important to you to understand what you're doing and sort of engage and have a robust process for doing it. But if, if you're focusing on the phases and getting the phases right, you're sort of missing the bigger picture, which is what is the overall, um, what am I doing here, which is trying to, trying to grapple with and, and ascertain and use all my skills as a situated subjective researcher to figure out what is the important story that I want to tell about my data set, or you know, what is the important story for the people in my data set, or what is the important story in this media representation, you know, and that's a subjective judgment. Um, it's not quantifiable necessarily. Um, and the steps are kind of tools. And the, the things that we talk about are kind of heuristic devices to kind of explain something, but they're not, they're not what it's ultimately about. Does that make sense? So kind of 
the following of the steps and the procedures is useful for people who are learning and understanding and engaging and doing, um, but they're not the sort of be all and end all. And that's why they're sort of, um, they're not rules, um, they are guidelines. Um, and, you know, when I do analysis, I don't follow this practices like that, I go all over the place. Um, but I have decades of understanding what it is that I'm doing analytically and how I can ensure that I'm doing it in a robust way that I feel confident and able to defend what I've done and confident that my analysis is valid based on the data set. Mm -hmm. Just a brief comment on that. Thank you for that answer. I'm just on the tail end of four years of using all this and I didn't use those phrases, but I kept them in mind. And they and then I used them to go back and check myself. <laughs> and then they became intuitive. And at the end, then I went back and used them again to check myself. I found them very useful in that way, but I didn't follow them step by step because they were sort of more, it was a more intuitive process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I'm glad that I haven't, you know, said things here which have now at the end of your four years made you feel like it's all been complete. No, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's better than my student evaluation, so I'll just think that. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the case. The process is iterative and open, and it is about being thorough and rigorous and kind of understanding the conceptualization of what it is that you're doing. And these are kind of tools and techniques to get you there, but then those tools and techniques aren't the, you know, you can you you can apply those six phases and you might do a terrible analysis, but you might not apply those six phases in the exact way that's been described and do an excellent analysis. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, do you think there's any value in doing a sort of like a quasi verification where you run an analysis, a thematic analysis like five years or whatever? And then run the same data set again, sort of because we're talking about positionality as it changes. So the subjectivity. Is there any value in sort of looking at something? I can give you a real world example of um, some researchers who, not necessarily just with TA and not necessarily quite in the terms that you're describing, but they um, they did. Um, I think the paper is called something like "I Return to Sit with the Data." So they did an analysis that was part of a PhD and they did it and they wrote it up. And then two years later, they went back to the data set and wrote a completely different analysis because they were situated differently, they were asking different questions and so on. So I wouldn't frame it in terms of kind of replication so much as, you know, how you might gain different insights. And there's lots of discussion, like some journals would be like, you can't have more than one analysis from a qualitative data set or your salami slicing or your this or your that. And it's like you don't understand qualitative analyses because you've you've suggested that there's only one analysis in there where lots of times there's many things going on that you might be wanting to write about and write, wanting to engage with. And I had an example that was about five years where I started analyzing some data and I coded and I had like an idea of what my themes might be. And about five years happened. Eventually, I got back to the data set, and my my analysis was completely different because it was it was richer and it was way better than it would have been five years previously, I think. And but you know, and so that happened. But you, it's always going to reflect where you're at, and you know, and I mean, let's talk pragmatically: what time and resources and things you have available to you. But yeah, I wouldn't frame it in terms of one being right or wrong so much as you know, what questions do you ask and what do you get out of it and what do you bring to it? You know, as you say, five years later, you're a different researcher, you're a different person. All right, awesome questions. Thank you, everybody. Let's give another round of applause. Sorry to the people that I didn't get to your questions. <laughs> and please do stick around, uh, socialize, chat, meet somebody new, have some food, uh, enjoy. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>